debate. And thank you for waiting. Uh, shortly, we'll get to the good things. So um, without too much introduction, I simply wanted to uh, state that in today's world, computing, communications, the digital economy are taking increased roles. And one of the countries that has been a leader in this area in problems that comes from being very wired. The Republic of Estonia has had uh, great success as a leading country in Europe, in the world, in digital economies, uh, but has also been a victim of some of the problems. We are very privileged today to have as our speaker uh, Her Excellency, the Ambassador from the Republic of Estonia, uh, I should say, the Ambassador Extraordinary and the Plenipotentiary to the United States from the Republic of Sonia, Marina Kalyurand. Remember what I said about wiring and digital? Here we are. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the recording. It was raining here, there was a big accident on halfway to Lafayette, and still I'm here. And I'm so happy that not just two of us with Lou, but even some more people. So it's either, either you know and love Estonia, or you don't know anything about Estonia. And in that case, I'll be very happy and privileged to talk today about my country. After that, as we're sh uh, running short on time, I know that people have to leave at some point. Please feel free to leave. I won't take it personally. And if there are any questions about Estonia, I'll be most happy to stay here longer and answer some questions. But to start with, I'd like to start with some PowerPoints. The first one. That's the picture of Europe <laughs> as Americans see it. <laughs> It's from internet. <laughs> Estonia is here. The second, another version, <laughs> how Americans do see Europe. Estonia is a country pretending not to be Soviet Russia. The small and brown here. Now the real geographical map. That's the map of Europe. If you look at the map, then again, Estonia, small country in the northeastern part of Europe. We can say that in the periphery of Europe, small population 1.3 million, which is one street in Cairo, one district in DC. How many people are in Lafayette? One? Uh, 100,000, so 10 times bigger than Lafayette. That's the whole country. Our, uh, our size is 40, 45,000 square kilometers. So you can cross country from one border to another border to any other point, any other border in four hours. So that's the size of the country. But we definitely prefer to see it that way. Do recognize this, the sign? The Skype. Skype was invented in Estonia. I have to be honest, it was invented by Estonian guys, the ponytail guys, but the money came from Scandinavia. It was financed by Swedes and Danes, which, which proves once more that they are not silly people, they know whom to support, but their brains were Estonians. So when I talk about my country, we definitely would like to see us not as a northeastern, far northeastern part of Europe, but rather small country, but interesting country, country that has the niches, the country that is respected and well known. And during the time I have, I'd like to talk about mainly three things. First, just general picture about Estonian history, so, you, so that you understand where did we came from and where are we today. Then about cyber, which is definitely our niche, and even our name, Estonia, comes from E 
Estonia. So everything, all the, all the services are, e electronic services are and on internet. And then as you are the business community or the future business community, I'll talk a little about doing business in Estonia and why Estonia is a good place to come to stay and why to do business there. Climate is more or less as here, so you, you, don't, you won't be disappointed in that sense. And I think we can keep this map so that Skype will remind you all the time what country we're talking about. Estonia declared independence and became independent in 1918. 1918. Before that, Estonia was part of different countries and it was occupied by different kingdoms, countries. It was part of Germany, part of Denmark, part of Sweden, part of Russia, part of different countries. Everybody who had time and interest invaded us at one point or another. So in 1918, Estonia became independent and we lost our independence in 1940. First, we were occupied by Soviets. Then we were occupied by Nazi Germany, and after that again by Soviets, who freed us from Nazis, but didn't leave, stayed in the country. So before the two world wars, Estonia was independent for 22 years. Estonia regained independence in 1991, which means that uh, this year we celebrated our 95th anniversary and 22 years of restoration of independence. That's the same time that we were independent between the two wars. For us, it's a very emotional date. It's blessed date, it's girls date, but anyway, we crossed it. Which means that today we, don't, we, we remember history. All nations have to remember history, but we are more confident and more self-confident, looking into the future. What are the lessons that we learned from history? Uh, before the Second World War, our leaders believed in being neutral. They believed that a small, neutral country could survive. The country didn't survive. In 39-40, like that, we disappeared from all geographical maps. So your parents, when they studied geography or studied history, didn't study Estonia. Estonia wasn't existing. So when we regained independence in 91, the first and most important task was to restore ourselves in Europe and restore ourselves globally from where we were hidden behind the Iron Curtain for more than 50 years. So the aim was to get integrated with all the like-minded organizations and all the other countries that think like we do. So today, Estonia is the most integrated country among the Baltic countries. Just one behind, Just one back. Mm -hmm. Most integrated country among the Baltic countries. Baltics are Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, yeah? And the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and Denmark. We are members of NATO, we are members of the EU, we are members of Eurozone, we are members of Schengen. Two years ago we joined uh, OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, if I compare with other countries, for example, uh, Latvia and Lithuania are today not members of Eurozone, not members of OECD. Finland, Sweden, not members of NATO. Uh, Norway, not member of EU. Denmark, not member of uh, e uh, Eurozone. So all the other countries have some exceptions. Our regional cooperation is excellent. Because I think that we understand being relatively small countries, all of us, we can't compete. We can be successful as a region, Baltic and Baltic Nordic region. But Estonia is the most integrated among the countries. Integration. Why did we do it? We're not collecting memberships. It's good, of course, to be a member of a like-minded alliance, but not, that's not the aim. The aim is to participate in decision-making, to sit around the table instead of being dinner on the table. So, so, so that's why when we are in the EU, we are one among 28. When we are in NATO, we are one among 28, which means that our voice counts. 
of course we can't be good in all international questions and I, I don't want to say that Estonia will play internationally the same role as let's say the permanent members of the UN Security Council are playing. We will not be able to do that. With our financial resources, with our manpower, there are just limitations. But we are ready to share responsibility. For example, we're running to be non-permanent members of the Security Council in 2021. Which means that even a small nation of 1.3 million can take responsibility. In the EU and NATO, we are among, we are, we, when I said who occupied us, by our nature, we are very Lutheran. Hard working, not like Italians or Greeks who have wine and fiesta and enjoy food. We never. We eat at work. We don't eat at all. We have very bad climate. We work, we work, we work. That's very Lutheran and very German. So I think that's partly the German influence that my country has had. Even during the Soviet occupation, the Soviets used to say in Moscow, the students are so good. They're fulfilling all the silly requirements with the punctuality of Germans. So that's the nature. When we joined the organizations, for us, it was important to have also uh, uh, to fulfill all the commitments. So if you know about the commitments, for example, in NATO, there is a commitment to, to allocate 2% of GDP for defense. 2% of GDP. Today there are four countries that are doing that. Who are the countries? US, UK, Greece, and Estonia. Poland is coming pretty close, 1.85 something. The other laying far behind. Some countries even under 1%. When we talk about Eurozone, we were the last country to join. I don't want to say that we're stupid. For us, it was a win-win situation. Being a small nation with our own currency, we felt that, uh, we, we didn't feel, but we had data that investors were not trusting us. They were waiting for our own, our own currency to be devaluated. So we were losing investments. That's why we had to join a bigger club to prove. For us, it was the sign of quality. That's why we joined in the 2011 Eurozone. And when today we talk about the crisis in Eurozone, it's not the crisis of the currency of Euro. It's the crisis of trust, and it's the crisis of not fulfilling commitments. Uh, why, why can I say uh, that it's not, uh, uh, that it's not the crisis of uh, Euro as currency? Look how the currency is doing, pretty well. Look at the countries who want to join Eurozone. So there is a queue behind the door. So it gives us, uh, it gives us cer certain security. In Eurozone, uh, we are among, again, three or four countries who fulfill the Eurozone criteria, which means budgetary discipline, financial discipline, public debt, our public debt is under 10%, and all the other requirements. When we had economic crisis that hit Estonia in 2008, our economy fell more than 10% of GDP. Our government introduced real cuts. Budget was cut 10%, salaries were cut 20%. These were real cuts. Everybody's salaries were cut. Embassies were not closed, but our sizes became much smaller. And all the, the actions that were undertaken, they were very real actions. The only spheres that were not touched were education, research, development, social benefits, because if compared to other European uh, pensioners, our retired people are living relatively poorly. Because if we put Estonia on the European map, we are even below the average of Europe. We are doing pretty well among the last 10 countries that joined the EU, but on the average we can't compare ourselves with Finland or other Scandinavian countries. At the same time, we are bailing out Greece. We are bailing out Spain. Although we are, we are not as rich as those countries are. For us, it's the question of solidarity. As I said, we remember what happened in 39 and 40. And now when we know that somebody needs help, needs assistance, we are ready to do that. Hoping that we will not disappear like, like that from the map anymore. Uh, when I, uh, during my speech, I think I'll be, I'll be comparing us to Finland for several reasons. 
before 1940, before the Second World War, Estonia and Finland were very close. There were even discussions about creating one state. Because if you look at the map, the distance between Tallinn, our capital, and Helsinki, the capital of Finland, is 70 kilometers. We have 24 uh, ships going from one capital to, the, to another, and you can cross the bay in one hour and 15 minutes from center to center. So there are lots of Estonians who want to work to Finland. Unfortunately, not so many Finns are working in Estonia yet. But, but uh, we feel more like a twin city or twin country. And before the Second World War, our development was the same. So if somebody wants to say that the Soviet influence was good, then look at the statistical data. After we regained independence, our GDP wasn't even half of Finland's. So in 50 years, we lost a lot, and now we have to gain it. I talked about solidarity, I talked about integration, I talked about bailing out Greece. Although I have to say that uh, the public support for bailing out countries that are richer than we are, the public support is, uh, is failing or, for, or is declining. Because what our people want to see, that's fine, we can support, but you have to do your structural reforms, you have to do your things. You have to cut your budget, you have to cut your salaries, not to pay 13th, 14th salary, and not to uh, and pay all the taxes. And don't tell us that these decisions are not popular and people won't vote for the government. People aren't silly. In Estonia, the same government that did all the cuts was re-elected back. So people do understand what's really good for the nation, what's really good for the government and for economy. And uh, what else, uh, why else, why can we say that we're looking more, uh, more proudly or more securely into the future? If after the Second World War, we were the consumers of international security, then today with our NATO allies, we are providers of international security. Our troops were in Iraq, our troops are in Afghanistan. And although the number of troops is small, it's 150 soldiers, but per capita, it's one of the highest numbers. And our soldiers are in the most difficult part in, in the south of Afghanistan, in Helmand, which means that they are ready to fight, they are ready to be there, and not only in the safe places around Kabul or some airports like, like some other nations are doing. We will withdraw from Afghanistan with NATO, as agreed, together in, together out. But we will continue with our development cooperation projects. We remember very well how at the beginning of the 90s, when we were... What, what was the beginning of 90s? We were Soviet Union. It was a communist... Okay, it was a communist state. It was ruled by Moscow. Our economy was 100% tied to the rest of the Soviet Union. And in 22 years, we become market economy, democratic state, governed, uh, governed by the rule of law. So when the reforms started in Estonia at the beginning of 90s, we were very much supported by our friends. Friends being the United States, Canada, lots of other countries, I'm not going to name them all. And our neighbors, Scandinavians. We received experts, we received financial aid, we even received food aid when Russia cut us off and we were left without electricity and without food. So the support was very important for us. That helped us. And today, being in the club of the rich countries of the OECD, we have the obligation to assist those who need our help. You can't bring democracy to another country. There has to be wish also from that side. So the countries with whom we are cooperating very closely are in our neighborhood, the former USSR republics, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, to some extent Belarus, but they are having very difficult 
leadership at the moment, so it's pretty, no way we want to support the regime, which means that we're help, helping to keep their online systems working, we are helping them in cyber questions. When Georgia was attacked in 2008, then the servers of Georgia were mirrored in Estonia, and we helped them from security, cyber security point of view. So these are the things where we are good. We don't limit us only to the neighbors. So that, for example, we're introducing electronic government in Palestine, we're doing projects in Burma, in Tunisia, in Haiti, in lots of other countries. In those countries, we can't be alone. We don't have embassies in Africa. Historically, we don't know Africa. We don't know. We don't know the countries, we don't know the language, we don't know the culture, because we haven't been there. That's why we can go there together with somebody, being it other EU member states or the United States, the same Asia. We don't know all Asian countries, which means that if we want to go there with our reforms and democracy, we can do it with somebody, our reforms and the knowledge of the region. And from here, I'll, I'll continue with being small. For centuries, if you were small, it was a disaster. Because first you were counted how big army you had, then it was important how many banks and what was your economy. But nowadays we feel that small could be good if small is efficient. So sometimes we compare ourselves to small fishes. Small fish has to be more quick, has to be much more adaptable flexible to survive in the pool. The huge shark can sleep in the corner and the fish will just swim into the mouth. So I think that's the comparison which, which puts a small country on the map. Estonia was the first country in the world to fall on the cyber attack. Those cyber attacks were in 2007 and they were DDoS attacks, denial of service attacks. Maybe some countries even don't notice that they are attacked today. We noticed. Because as I said, we are very electronic e-dependent. So when, if, I might, if I might use the words of Hamlet, who said to be or not to be, then our case 20 years ago was to e or not to e, and we decided to e. So uh, we were the first country in the world to introduce electronic government, which works online without any papers. First electronic voting, and when I say electronic voting, I mean voting in internet or on cell or if it, uh, iPhones. I read that Maryland was also having e-voting during the presidential elections, which meant that you went on a website, you printed the document, you filled it in, and then you faxed it. I'm, that's not uh, electronic voting I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, voting in internet. 99% uh, of our taxes, tax reforms, are filled on internet. We have electronic school, internet school. When I was posted to Russia, I was ambassador to Russia, and my kids stayed at home, they were graduating uh, in high school. I had online information about their grades, about their assignments, I don't want to say that it's a good thing to be distant from your children. It's never good, but it's better. I was always informed. So even before they came home, I could call them. What's that? What, 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 what I'm seeing on internet? So ch teachers were chatting, we were exchanging information. I can say the same of uh, electronic health. My medical data is in internet, and I'm the owner of my medical data, and I choose if I send it to first doctor, second doctor, tenth doctor. Electronic prescriptions. With my ID card, I can buy it in any pharmacy in, in Estonia. Altogether, we have about 300 internet services. And don't tell that internet is for young people. My mother is 88, she's Skyping. She's doing all her transactions because it's much more convenient. She's talking to her, doctor, to her doctor, she's having prescriptions, she's using that. Even my dogs are learning to Skype. Okay, they're very smart dogs, but, <laughs> but, but even my dogs are Skyping. 
they don't answer me yet. <laughs> but if my husband feeds them, they stay in front of the computer. I'm working on that. So, uh, but it means that you have to provide uh, internet. Estonia is covered, uh, we're covered 100%, but we never say, let's say 999 .9, because there might be a spot somewhere. But by principle, it's 100% covered uh, by internet and Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi in all schools, all universities, all restaurants, all hotels, all public buildings, all libraries, everywhere. So you have to provide. Because if you provide electronic services and people don't have computers, or they don't, have to, don't know how to use them, that's not right. And they have to have choice. So although my mother is very internet conscious, she likes to go to chat with other ladies, and she likes to go to bank, to talk to the, per to, to the personnel. So they have to have also that part, if they want. Our electronic voting, now we've been electronically voting since 2007. Uh, first year, uh, in first elections, the participation was about 10%. Now, the last elections we had a month ago, electronic participation was 25%. What's good about that? It invites young people to participate. I don't know what about you, but let's say students back in Estonia, I can't say that they're politically very active. Well, majority of them just doesn't care. But doing it on internet, it's fun. There are always questions of cyber security. How secure is internet voting? In our case, we have, uh, we have uh, certain measures to secure it. For example, you can change a vote until the final date of voting. So that if you stand behind me and force me to push the button, once you leave, you can't be with me 24-7. Once you leave, I go to the computer and I change my vote. And in the final instance, you can always go and have the traditional voting on the right voting day. So anyway, nobody has today proved that electronic life is not safe. For example, medical data. If you have the files in the cabinet, anybody can go there and look at the papers. But if it's done on internet, it's flagged. We have had cases where, for example, there was a policeman who wanted to check data about his girlfriend. It was flagged, he was fired. So he, he, he had the right to access only to the data that he needs to know, and it could be checked, it could, it could be controlled. With cyber comes also another topic that is our topic, it's internet freedom. We think that internet freedom is a human right, like all others. There is very delicate question between the privacy and state security, and balance between them. It's a very difficult question. And nobody can today say the precise rules or the precise principles. But we all know that cyber came to stay. Cyber will not disappear. So we have to get used to that and we have to live with that and we have to find the real balance. So globally and in the organizations, we are very, uh, we are among the like-minded countries who promote internet freedom and who build coalitions so that not to restrict internet for other purposes, like some countries are doing. For three years in the world, we were number one on internet freedom. This year, we lost our position. We lost it to Iceland, but it's okay to lose to Iceland because they're really good. And anyway, we'll take the place back next year. So, <laughs> so but competition is always good. Uh, what else? Cyber hygiene. We call it cyber hygiene. This year we introduced programming and cyber hygiene to the kids in the first grade. Because the stereotype is that cyber is something so sophisticated. It's not. Once you push the button, it's already cyber. And children have to know. Once they have intriguing chats on the internet, or they put photos on Facebook that's not 100% protected. They have to know that once on internet, stays on internet. So that's why we're teaching our kids from the first grade. Skype is still having uh, their research and development 
headquarters in Tallinn. But we are not able to provide as many cyber specialists as we would, as we would like to. So that's one of the things where we have to be better. Uh, educating cyber specialists and educating cyber security specialists. In Tallinn we have the center of cyber security of NATO, we have the center of uh, information agency of the EU, so these are the topics. And that's why I can say that even a small country can find a niche and do something about that. And to conclude, doing business in Estonia, why is it good? First of all, look at the geography. Our geographical position is excellent. We are on the crossroads between east and west. Today we belong to the Nordic Baltic region, the countries around the Baltic Sea. And if you look at Europe, then the division doesn't go anymore new and old, east and west. Today the division is Europe is north and south. Liberal, uh, developing north, protectionist, stagnating south. That's not good. But that's the reality today. And as long as we can't change the whole EU, Europe, like that, we see that we can develop our region. Electronic services, we're doing a lot together with Finland. For example, you can start business in Estonia online in five to six minutes. So last year there were a thousand Finns who started business in Estonia online. Uh, our economists say that electronic government will raise Europe's GDP 4% if introduced. So it's much more efficient. We are very liberal. We are very liberal and we are open. We were so liberal that when joining the EU, we had to introduce trade restrictions to comply with the rules and regulations of the European Union. We have very simple taxation system. It's a flat tax rate 21% to corp uh, corporate tax rate for individuals for everybody. Reinvested profit is not is exempt from taxation. And there are uh, there are a couple of other things but again if you look at the size our market is almost non-existing. We depend on trade. We depend on exports and we depend on foreign investments. So who we are looking at? We are looking at Germany. Germany is our biggest and richest neighbor. So if Germany is doing well, we are doing well. Uh, the main investors into Estonia are Finns and Sweden. We are main investors into Latvia and Lithuania, but still it's relatively small. So the bigger picture is better and there is Germany, our trade partner number one. Russia. Russia is our trade partner number 5-6, so let's say 10% of our trade today is done with Russia. If you remember I said 91, it was 100, yeah? 20 years later, it's 10. And we don't want to increase it. That's okay. It's not because of the name of the country or the policy of the country. You don't want to be tied to one country too much. But with our emotions and our history, we don't want to be tied to that country more than 10%. At the same time, we we'll love Russian tourists. If you happen to come to Thailand, to Estonia during the Christmas or New Year, there are lots of Russians. They spend their money, they support our economy, they leave on time when their visas expire. What else can you want? So, so in that sense, we have, we have, I can't say, I, I never want to say very good, but we have normal relations. Can they be better? Yes, they can. There is not enough trust, there is not enough respect, but it takes generation. I think that maybe my kids are already there. My son was born in free, free Estonia, he was born in 92. My daughter was born during occupation 96, but still they're different. They look at the world differently. And when I was posted to Russia and my son together with his classmates visited us there, his reaction was, but the kids in Russia are exactly like us. They wear the same jeans, they listen to the same music, so that's something and they will find common language. Uh, so Russia is our trade partner, depending by 10% of our trade. 75% uh, of our trade is done with EU, 
we're single market and the rest 10% is with the rest of the world. Rest of the world meaning everybody. United States, China, Kazakhstan, you name everybody. Uh, and now the final, I just like the quotation. Uh, somebody sent it to me. It was a quotation from a venture capitalist who was asked a question. I just find it. I just find it. Okay. Uh, the interview, there was an article, and it was uh, with a venture capitalist in Venture Capital magazine. Well, the article was very technical about what is he doing and why is he investing only in Silicon Valley, why isn't he moving to Europe? And he was, the direct question was, do you ever go anywhere else? Do you go to Europe? He thought, and then he said, there's nothing happening in Europe, except, well, London has a little bit, and there is a very old place called Estonia mm -hmm. that just keeps churning out new stuff. Okay. So, and, uh, and uh, another proof, the first year I was posted to the United States, I was watching the Colbert Report, yeah? Do you watch it from time to time? Yeah. It was on the 24th of February. 24th of February is our Independence Day. And Stephen Colbert said, and by the way, today is the birthday of Estonia. Happy birthday, Estonia, small state with a huge PR department. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll finish here my brief introduction to Estonia. It's a nice place to go. How many have been there? Nobody. Okay, one, but is it true what I'm saying? Yes. You see? <laughs> but, but anyway, come. I know it's far. The best way is to do a Baltic cruise. You visit a lot of capitals. We, as I said, we are 70 kilometers from Helsinki. We are 300 from St. Petersburg, 300 to Stockholm, 300 to Riga. And, and if you cruise the other capitals on the Baltic Sea, you'll come back to Estonia, I know that. <laughs> so you can start with a cruise. Uh, nature, because I think that your generation is still, how do you call them, back. The, the ones who run around, around with the... Yeah. Yes, you do that, yeah? That's a nice place to do that. That's a safe place to do that. So, and before Google us, you'll find a lot of things on internet. You can start a businesses via internet. And, and, and the final, there is even hashtag Estonian Mafia, which was invaded by the Silicon Venture capitalists who once noticed that uh, in the European startups competition last year, among 30 companies, seven were Estonians. Mm -hmm. Year before that, among 24 or five were Estonians. So, if you're in IT, in IT business, Estonia is the country to come and see what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And. If, if somebody has to leave, please leave. As I said, I will not be hurt. But if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. And the mic is coming. Oh, okay. Why, why did you visit Sonia? Oh, you see. So, uh, oh, sorry, my father is Latvian. Yes, please. Um, my name is Evelyn, and I'm a junior studying management finance. So you've been uh, saying that uh, Estonia is a good place to uh, invest. Yes. But just imagine that you are talking to a group of uh, to a group of investors. Well, um, and they have money. They want invest to uh, that they, they want invest in is uh, in Estonia. Like, why? Like, what should investors invest in? Like, what is is what is Estonia good at making producing? Uh, what we say, first of all, it's very good and cheap to have headquarters in Estonia. For example, headquarters that take care of the Scandinavia, East and the Baltics. Because today we are still, as I said, we are uh, below the average of the EU, which means that our salaries are lower, but our people are well educated, if you look at the OECD reports. So bring your headquarters. 
As to investors, the way they have always tailor-made approaches. Once they come and they say what are their interests, they will be provided a package. Uh, we see ourselves as a, a transportation corridor. If you look at the sea, then Tallinn is the most north port that doesn't freeze in the winter. If you move more to Russia, then the ports freeze. Even uh, the port in Helsinki freeze. So we are the most northmost port that doesn't freeze. If you take the, 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 the economy rule that the best business is done within 1,000 uh, kilometers, then in 24 hours you can reach a circle of countries. So see us also as a gateway to Russia. And, but more uh, open, uh, if you look at doing business in Estonia, we are listed as country, I think, n number 21. If you read uh, corruption, almost non-existing, as, uh, as we have electronic government and lots of electronic services, uh, it's easy. And, and I think that one very serious point is political stability. Uh, starting from 91, We'd be moving in one direction because we were in the same place with countries like Georgia, Ukraine, other the former Soviet Union countries. So look where they are today. That's a huge difference because they've been flip flopping. Our uh, movement has been more or less in one direction, so it's stability. Am I selling well? Good. Because I'm paid to sell in the country. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I study mass communication and I know nothing. Estonia, so okay. this was a lot of fun. Um, do you Just fun, also knowledge. Knowledgeable and amazing, yes. and everything. Um, you mentioned earlier in 2007 you had you suffered from cyber attacks. Yes. Uh, what made you decide that, well, the country decide that its most valuable asset is going to be an electronic format when the first thing that happened, the greatest thing would have been this cyber attack? Uh, the decision, the, the decision to, to introduce electronic services were made, was made before. There were several driving forces. I think first was that we were absolutely fed up with Soviet system. Nobody wanted to function like Soviet corrupt system. So it was sure we want to go in another direction. At the same time, that was the time when our closest friends, Finns and Swedes, tried to bring us their old computers that they didn't use anymore, and we refused. So we... We didn't have that step of old computers. We went directly to, 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 to the next generation of personal computers, Skype. It was invented in Estonia, but it still has influence. I think it's the question, it's the mentality. If somebody who, who lives in the country and has the same education I have, as, I, as I have could invent, then also can I. All those factors and, uh, no, no, it's a joke, and also the climate. <laughs> because starting from November till March, you almost don't see sun. It's cold, it's wet, it's dark, lots of snow. So what can you do? Either programming or babies. <laughs> <laughs> so half population. <laughs> so, so, so I think it's everything together and traditionally, uh, sciences have been taught in Estonia. If you look at any of the reports of the OECD, we are rated very high. Close to Finland, Iceland, uh, Singapore, uh, in the group of those countries. So even when Estonians were peasants, it was the question of honor to give education to children, to educate children. So the, people, the population is, uh, is, is well educated. And the government is supporting uh, computer sciences, so everybody who wants to study computer sciences or sciences is supported by the government and government is supporting startups, there are special incubators. So it also means that government has to allocate finances to keep it going. The 2007, uh, the DDoS attacks that came, I can name the country, they came from Russia. Why, why we're so sure there was lots of research done uh, on that question. And at that time, we had the lowest of our bilateral relations with Russia. We, our relations were not good. And it was for the first time when one country used political influence and cyber attacks. A year later, we saw in Georgia, 
classical kinetic attacks and cyber attacks. In our case, the attacks were pretty, pretty poor in the sense that they were denial of service attacks. Okay, a couple of websites went down. A couple of banks went down. We noticed it. The, the, I think we think that the aim was to create instability among population, but we were well prepared. We didn't know about the attacks beforehand, but that was the time when we had our first electronic elections. So all the hackers, everybody in the, in the cyber community was trying to, to attack the electronic voting. So there was full alert in the country, and then we received the cyber attacks, so we were prepared. And something that happened, I don't know whether it happens in other countries or not, but the same guys with the ponytails, whom Estonian government never could pay a salary because they're so expensive, uh, they created Cyber Defense League, and they work voluntarily with government. So they're doing uh, either their lawyers' business, computer sciences business, economist business during working hours where they get their salaries from and the rest of the time they work for government without any fees, without payment. It's a cyber defense league and it's very prestigious to be a member of that league. What do they get from that? Uh, they participate in uh, cyber exercises together with government officials. Again, we were the first country in the world to teach all our government ministers. They, they had our cyber exercise. They were conservative. They didn't want to do that, but they were pushed in one room, door was shut, and they simulated cyber exercise. They did it. So, 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 so the, the private personnel, the private people who are part of Cyber Defense League, they, they are the ones who stage the exercises. It's a lot of fun. They have good contacts. And being a nation 1.3 million, it's, not, it's like a country club. Everybody knows everybody. So, so maybe that's also different from a my, my, my much bigger country. So all these things together. Because the same question was asked by CEO of Google, by Schmidt from our president. And nobody can, we were thinking about it, we were elaborating, and these were more or less the points that we came up. It's a million dollar question. Hello, I'm Michael. I'm a, a graduate student in the computer science department here. Um, but I was just wondering, how do you think your systems would scale to larger countries? Um, and like, for instance, has anyone looked to mimic your, or your government uh, mm -hmm. cyber? For instance, with the healthcare website here, for instance, yeah. have you like has anyone asked well, like how did you guys do it or? You know? uh, yes, we are consulting with other countries. I can't say that on the, on the healthcare problem that you're having at the moment. Not on that. And definitely, we're not going. We're not preaching around the world that that's the best solution. What we're saying, uh, what we're saying is that look at our solutions. Maybe there's something you can you, you can use, because all countries are different. When I said that we cut our budget ten percent, we don't have internal. Our internal market is, is so small. We are dependent on uh, exports and uh, foreign. We could do that. Um, for other countries, maybe the solution is uh, to cut the budget and to. Uh, support, uh, uh, put, put money into creating businesses. What's the word? Uh, austerity and uh, opposite of austerity. Uh, Come on, guys, graduate students. <laughs> okay, you, you understand what? Stimulation. stimulation. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So there has to be a right balance between austerity and stimulation. In our case, it was more austerity. Germany used much more stimulation. The same goes with cyber. That's our case. But even in the EU, when we're talking to other countries, oh, it's tough. Sometimes it's even more difficult than negotiating with Russians because they are so conservative. We wanted to introduce electronic health in the EU. We didn't succeed. So we'll start with our region. We are doing just now together with Finland. Then we'll get, have Sweden on board. Then we'll go to the Baltics. And maybe after that, Southern Europe will, Europe will wake up. So we are, we are not saying that our solution is the best. What we are saying is, look at that, maybe there's something useful you can, you can, you can look at. So we wanted to thank the ambassador for coming and giving us such a knowledgeable and, um, so lecture today. So can we just... Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
and thank you for waiting 